What's up, everybody? We're checking in on the YSL trial. Is it over? Is this thing over? Will it end in a mistrial? Will it end in some plea deals? We're going to talk about all that today. We're going to look at what was the final straw to kind of lead the judge to even offer a mistrial option to these defense attorneys. We're going to talk about what it means if they reject it. And what's going on right now? Why are we paused until Monday? I'm going to bring my dad on. We're going to watch some clips, react to this case, and try to figure out what happens next. So this is the never-ending case that might actually be over now or close to it or moving in that direction, and we'll talk about why. But um, do you think that over the past couple of weeks, we haven't done a bunch of updates, has anything changed or has it still felt like the same vibe of bad prosecutorial work, witnesses saying things they shouldn't, defense attorneys continuing to press, continuing to ask for mistrials, make their objections? Is there anything different that you've noticed over the last couple of weeks or has it just been more of the same? It's, it's more of the same. It's, it's more of the total incompetence of a prosecutorial office, total incompetence of a litigator. Uh, everything just shows it hasn't changed and they haven't learned, which, which really is the, the real key here is this judge has tried to teach them and they just don't pick up on it or they just don't care. Yeah. And even they had different prosecutors in and some of the old prosecutors in, and now that they might be talking plea deal, We'll remember that and remember how the prosecutors have worked with whether or not the defense attorneys will even continue to work with those prosecutors in the plea deals. But first, I think we need to watch, we're just going to watch two kind of quick clips from day 150, day 150 of trial as to how they're just not prepping their witnesses and damning information is coming out about these criminal defendants that's irrelevant and shouldn't come out in trial and how we can't unring a hundred bells as the defense attorneys say, but we're going to listen to two quick clips get your reactions, why it's such a big deal, and kind of where we go from here. And what is your relationship like, if any, with him? Now? Um, let's talk about before now. Oh, we're cool. Are you still cool now? Uh, I don't know him right now. He's been locked up for a couple of years. Well, I ain't supposed to say that. Disregard that. I'll just tell you about this witness. Definitely didn't seem like he was doing this stuff on purpose, but she's asking him questions that elicit that. It's like, yeah, we used to be cool. Well, how about now? The only reason they're not cool now is because he doesn't have a relationship with him because he's been locked up. It's like, why is yeah, that such a big deal? First off, let's just talk about that real quick. Why is it such a big deal if you do everything to put them in street clothes so they look like they're not in jail? Um, why is it such a big deal that the jury not think, even if some of the jurors may assume that they're in jail waiting or during the trial, why is it so important for that information not to come out in front of the jury? Well, the, the fact that he's been in jail, the jury knows there's pressure on him. There's additional reasons why he might cooperate in order to get out of jail. Um, you know, you look at his testimony and he's not the same guy that Woody was. Right. Or, you know, or, or, or Sledge. Uh, I don't remember. Uh, I, I don't know this. I don't know that. He was trying to answer the questions. He was cooperating. And he was being a witness for the prosecution. Uh, he, you know, there's there's no reason to be upset, the prosecutor to be upset with him. It's clearly she didn't prep him. But I'm uh, talking about the defendant sitting in that courtroom. For the jurors to not know they're in jail is such an important well, factor because you come into the courtroom, you're already behind the eight ball. They know these people have been arrested. They know the prosecutors think they did it. The cops think they did it. If you know they're sitting in jail the whole time, jurors tend to think, well, they must have a lot of evidence if they're going to hold him in jail for all these years. He must be guilty if he's sitting in jail this whole time. And it just kind of adds to that mountain that is against a criminal defendant the day the trial starts in normal lay people's minds. Most of them think like, if the cops arrest you, if the everybody in the court here thinks you did it, then you probably did it. And defense attorneys sometimes have to fight against that, even though that's not how the system is set up. That is some of the damning irrelevant evidence that shouldn't come in. And that's why it doesn't come in because it's damning in front of a jury. Well, I, I got to tell you that you're right in the majority of trials. Uh, in this trial, there's no doubt in my mind, these jurors know there are people sitting in jail. Sure. Um, you know, I, I mean, you know, th th they know it. So this is no shock to the jury that this guy's been in jail. But no, no, it's not this guy. He's talking about one of the defendants. 
Oh, I think didn't he say I've been in jail, so I haven't had contact no, with him? No, 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 no. He's talking oh, okay. about she's asking about all these different defendants and his relationship with them is okay. still good. So, like he the reason she's trying to build credibility, saying, like, you're still cool with these people and you're gonna testify for us against them. What he's saying is, I don't have a relationship with this guy right now. I think it's Shannon. I don't have a relationship with him right now because he's been in jail the last couple of years. And so to sit there and say that each one of these defendants has been in jail the last couple of years, to me, is not a good look for the defendants. And regardless if the jury knows it, to put a witness on the stand to say it is improper in every criminal case, especially when they're sitting here in street clothes. And again, this happens here and this is what happens again later to create the situation where it's a compounding problem in the totality of the circumstances that you just can't keep doing this. Just prepare the witness. Tell them. Don't say anything about anybody being in jail. That's all you have to do to tell this witness. And he probably wouldn't have said it. It may have slipped still, but at least do your job as a prosecutor and, and uh, prepare your witnesses. Anything to add? Well, no. Was there an objection here? Yes, there was an and objection. And that's why he was like, oh, and he's like, was I not supposed to say that? So yeah, so that that's what happened there. And then we get to um, the one that kind of was the final straw. And we'll listen right, to that. That's, that's the one that I was looking at, right? The final straw. I'm going to show you what's been marked as 37 and admit it. Oh, that was my uh, Mitch Tate name. That's why he put the hashtag. He was supporting my Mitch Tate. Your mixtape was No Slime Left Behind. Yes. What made you name your mixtape No Slime Left Behind? Like the uh, No Child Left Behind thing that's, that, you know, in school. Okay. I just named it that No Slime Left Behind. And when you were talking about slime, who were you were you referencing anyone in particular? Um, no, not nobody in particular. Um, no, I just wanted to be different. I just named it that. <coughs> we're gonna publish 37 and in. Who um is in 37 and in? OG Boo. OG boo. By the way, if you've ever made a, a post on um, Instagram, you can tell there's something uh, redacted, right? You can't just put a space after size right here. So it's clear to anybody that's ever posted on Instagram or Twitter or whatever that there's a redaction here, right? And that's what's up on the screen. And that's important to point out for what's happened, what's going to happen next. And who is that? Shannon. All right. And can you read for the jury the caption? Read his caption. Yes. Said ain't ain't none more compatible than a trench, a carving while in the trenches. And then is there a hashtag? Hashtag no slime left behind. And again, she's asking him to read the hashtags. Why? I don't understand why she needs it. We already talked about no slime left behind. He already testified to it. The fact that she's asking him to read the hashtags, knowing that there's this issue in the hashtags we're going to find out about is just wild to me. It's just a bad job. You didn't need to do it. Hashtag two bees, life size. Okay. And is there another hashtag? Free and then literally she's like, is there another hashtag after he's read the three? It's like, even if she wanted him to read book and riches, okay? I don't really know what that proves. Um, the jury can obviously see it. They're looking at it on the screen. Yet she asks the question and he reads the next hashtag from the paper he's looking at. Okay. And is there another hashtag? Free Quay. Is there another hashtag? And it's so obvious because when, when he said the jail thing before and when she, he said that, she's like, whoop, you can hear her being like, blah, 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 like, stop, stop, stop. And he does the Free Quay. Now, are any of these things the biggest deal in the world? No, individually. But how many times are they going to put witnesses up there to say, damning things about these defendants and having to unring the bell and give curative instructions and strike witness testimony to where enough is enough. And we're going to keep listening here to when the judge, judge kind of pipes in and they start making their arguments. Hashtag on the screen. Oh, no. Your Honor. It's in this paper Your right Honor. here. You got me reading. Your Honor, I, need, I have to make a motion. All right, I'm going to excuse you. I wasn't looking at the screen. I was looking at this paper. That's fine. Don't worry about it. Can I just step outside for just a minute and jury? Right. Thank you. So she sends the jury and the witness out. Your Honor, we're making a motion for a mistrial on behalf of Mr. Nichols. We're not going to be able to unring this bell. Your Honor, this is the exact same issue that while we were at the bench, uh, 
I brought it up. It was uh, exhibit 37 NN that the hashtag, there was a hashtag on that exhibit that said free Quay, which would definitely indicate to the jury that Quay, you know, has spent time in jail or in prison. The state agreed. We stipulated that they would redact it. And then the state presented, I guess, to the witness, the unredacted version, didn't prep him to not comment on it. And he did. And your honor. So that's wild. So they, they redact it for the one they're going to present to the jury. And I hope enter into evidence, but the one that she actually gives the witness is not redacted. And I mean, I would think if you're questioning a witness dad, you can tell, are they looking up at the screen as they're reading, or are they looking down at the piece of paper that you handed them? And if they're looking down at the piece of paper, you handed them, you better believe you better know whether or not that's redacted before you ask the question, what's the next hashtag when it's what everybody just agreed can't be read into evidence and you redacted it out. So it's knowing the prosecutor has no even argument here except mistake, obviously, because they agreed that it should be redacted out. And in fact, redacted it out to the one that was presented to the jury. All right. And the judge, and there's a record of it on the record. The judge knows it. Everybody knows it. Well, we're, we're going to talk about, we'll probably talk about how bad the prosecutor did. Yeah. When we have, when the judge is going to make it clear. Yeah. Yeah. We'll keep listening. Okay. Now, before uh, we had the opportunity for you to preside over us, this happened already again. And before, and I made a motion for a mistrial. Now it's happened again. So now the jury has repeatedly heard about Mr. Nichols being in jail, being in prison, and you cannot unring that bell. We would ask for a mistrial. Your Honor, uh, Ms. Carter Matthews or Mr. Marquette, Ms. Huey, we join in that motion for mistrial. And what's important for this court to, to know is that 45 minutes ago, uh, there had been a, a reference to a, a person being in jail. Now, that's the first one we listened to. That was 45 minutes before this. This witness has identified Marquavius Huey uh, and has also identified Marquavius Nichols. Um, so the, all the state had to do was ask this honorable court for an opportunity to have this witness uh, maybe step out of the courtroom and go over with that witness that, you know, we don't need to say anything about uh, someone in jail, what have you. That did not happen before uh, he went on the stand nor after that first uh, slip up by this witness. There may have even been a document right there on the witness stand that should have been pulled from the state of Georgia from that witness stand so that this could have been uh, avoided. So, Your Honor, we are joining in that motion as well. Oh, hang on. It's all right. Pretty simple. Pretty simple. It's, or you just didn't know, but we'll let you know when to come back in, okay? So we join in that motion, Your Honor. Your Honor, and I just want to briefly add that it is painfully obvious that the state is not prepping their witnesses. You can tell by the way when the witness spoke uh, the first time and he said, oops, am I not supposed to say that? Like, oh, I had no idea, which means it obvious that the state had not spoke to him, had not prepped them. And this has happened repeatedly. It's happening over and over again, Your Honor. And you're, we're just not going to be able to unring a hundred bills. And finally, Your Honor, Mr. Marquavius, Huey, we all have, it's been established that, uh, that his nickname is Quay. Okay. Isn't there going to be, I mean, we talked today about, isn't there going to be a stipulation that ref, uh, references to Quay, at least at some points, are not either um, Mr. Nichols or Mr. Huey? I mean, we, yeah. we did. Yes, yeah, sure. And that's a few things. So one, Your Honor, it was not intentional because we clearly- Okay, put, but it was put, sloppy because I presume he's reading from the document that you handed him instead of reading from the screen. And we should have instructed him to read from the screen, but- Or you when, should have presented with him with a document that had that part redacted. Issue, it's just sloppy. The issue came while, we, while he was on the stand, Your Honor. So the issue did not come prior to Ms. Westmoreland walked up to me while he was on, while he was on the stand and said, I'm going to have an issue with that. Can you redact it? That is when the state became aware. Then well, it should have occurred to you. You know what? I'm handing him a hard copy of this document that is unredacted. But I mean, not if he, not if there's multiple quays, Your Honor. If I don't know which quay that Hang on. Have. Can we stop having people come in and out when I've asked the witness to step out and every time the door opens, they can hear what we're talking about? Please, just for a few seconds. No matter how you cut it, this is pretty simple work and it is your job. And we, we know the prosecutor has no problem taking a break, talking to a witness is doing what they do. It's not like the judge is pushing this trial to finish quickly. And you're hearing just how simple it would have been for her to not have this problem come up. Well, everybody and, and you listeners should know huh. it is a regular occurrence huh? for a prosecutor. Oh, sorry. sorry. Okay. Go ahead. It is a regular occurrence for a prosecutor to ask for him. Everybody stays in the courtroom. The prosecutor goes outside, speaks to the witness before they come in gives them their instruction, and then the witness. It, it happens every day, all day, just like that lawyer said the prosecutor should have done. And it wouldn't have, I mean, no, it wouldn't have raised an eyebrow. And some people may think like, oh, the prosecutor's going to go tell a witness what to say, or I thought you couldn't do that. I thought that could be used against you. No, no, no. 
when they all agree to redact something and a lawyer's like, this witness cannot say this, when a defense lawyer is like, make sure this witness doesn't say it, they want a prosecutor to go talk to the witness and say, do not say this, and it, it is inadmissible. We say that to our clients in civil cases and criminal cases, whatever. It's like, you can't say this. I understand it's true. I understand it happens. You just can't say it. The judge has ruled. You cannot testify about that. So don't say it or we're going to have major problems. It could create a mistrial. We have that conversation with witnesses all the time on both sides. And so that is the point in which we learned of it is we redacted it on here. Ms. Westmoreland brought it up here. Yeah, and, when and I you didn't that, read it. I mean, so but the jury said, didn't see it, but now the jury has heard it. I don't think it is really that, you know, much of a crisis because there is going to be this stipulation that the, you know, Quay is not always either of these defendants. So nor is it obvious to everybody that free, you know, free whomever is such a quote about who knows, you know, everything these days. And so it doesn't necessarily indicate that whomever Quay is, Quay spent time in jail or in custody or in prison or anything. I mean, they say it about, you know, Hollywood stars who are in a breakup. I mean, it's it's a really, it's not so obviously, oh, this must mean this person was in prison. But all I don't necessarily disagree with the judge there. And, and again, I think on its own, if this was the only problem that had happened throughout the case, no big deal. Like it, it is what it is. We you know, we move on, we instruct the jury, curative instructions, strike the, the testimony, whatever it may be, and we just move on. But this, this case is different. Also, we were already saying Quay isn't either of these people. So let's just, and whether this was one of these people, or I don't even know who it did refer to. And we don't know because it's not his post. He was reading someone else's post. So it could be a multitude okay. of ways. You talked to his. All this, this discussion is irrelevant. Like, oh, is it not him? It could be a different Quay, et cetera. Everybody already agreed we're going to redact it. So everybody kind of already agreed it's prejudicial. Don't you think? Like this oh, conversation yeah. after the fact, oh, it's no big deal. It's like, well, we all agreed it was going to be struck. Do you agree with that? No, I, I agree. I, again, you know, again, and we also agree this is no big deal. We, we, we agree with that. The judge said it. I agree with that. Uh, there's a premise in the law called cumulative, where you start taking all the mistakes, and once you put all the little mistakes together, it becomes a big mistake. And and that's the point. That's what the judge is thinking about here when they're talking about it. She admits this is a small mistake on its own if you take it in an isolated way, but you can't look at it in just an isolated way. Not to mention they've also had big mistakes. Like there have been no, big no. and small mistakes throughout this trial to, to make it cumulative to get to the point where we're at now. Uh, just about a minute or two more, and then we'll get into the full discussion. Attorney yes. earlier, right? Yes. And did you get any kind of an indication? I don't know if this it was one of the things you were going to, but it's an issue now. And you said before lunch that you were going to ask Mr. Rubin. Yes, we did ask. Do you know at this point, whether um, the free Quay referenced, this wasn't even his post, was it? It wasn't. And so, and it wasn't an issue until Mr. West. So when I talked to Mr. Rubin at lunchtime, this wasn't something I was going to address with him because it wasn't an it, I did not realize it was an issue. Mr. Rubin found out for me that Slack Quay is not either of these two Quays. Okay, but this isn't Slack Quay. This is just Quay. Right. I know. So why doesn't everybody, well, they don't know how it's spelled. They only heard it. Why doesn't everybody just enter into some sort of a stipulation that the free Quay ref or the reference to Quay just now isn't either of these people? I don't know if it is. So it was whether it, okay. So judge is like, whether it is or not, let's just say it wasn't so we can make it irrelevant so we can get rid of this problem. The state can enter stipulation that we weren't referencing in we as the state of Georgia. Okay, that is not a reference to, if you would prefer no, I that. I don't know what the poster is referencing. I don't honestly really care what the poster was referencing. What I'm trying to do is fix your sloppiness. Can we can we stop there for a second? So that everybody. 20 more seconds and then I'm stopping. Okay. Good. Won't have wasted, you know, 10, 12 months of their lives in this trial. Yeah, we can, we can come over. Okay, do it now. All right. Y'all work on that. I'm going to take five minutes. All right. So that's how we got to all these reports now of potential mistrial. But before we get that, what did you want to say? Well, there is, there was a lot in what she just said, a, a lot of things to comment on. First off, I do have a criticism for the judge. 
Okay. I'm trying to fix your uh, sloppiness. That really is not something a judge should say. Uh, it, it shows a bias. And, and I like this judge. Uh, I, I don't think she is biased, but it does show that this is something I bet she, when she reads the transcript later on, she's probably going to wish she hadn't said. What she should have said was, I'm trying to make this trial fair for everybody. Uh, I'm trying to see that everybody has due process in this trial. But to try to fix mistakes made by the prosecutor, that really isn't her job. I'm sure she really didn't mean to say something like that. It, it just slipped out as kind of an unintentional slip. But that's not something she should have said. Uh, again, it's not her job. Uh, back before when she talked about a stipulation, what she's asking is for the prosecutor and the defense lawyers to get together and agree on an instruction to be given to the jury to tell the jury something about this free quay quote, saying jurors disregard it or jurors, it doesn't apply to anybody in this trial, something that they're going to agree on. Um, and since it's been very hard to get an agreement between the prosecutors and the defense lawyers, it's probably going to be hard to get an agreement on this because if the defense lawyers agree on an instruction, mm. it's going to mean they might waive their argument to a mistrial because, Judge, we think that this mistrial problem can be cured by an instruction. And they're not going to say or agree an instruction will cure this problem. So there was a lot in what was just said. Yeah, and that's the issue is if you agree to a cure in a stipulation, you're agreeing that that's enough. So I think if they ever were going to get to that point, they would say, we don't agree this fixes the problem, Judge. But if you're not going to grant a mistrial based on this problem, then our secondary acceptance would be this, this language saying, it's not referencing any of the defendants in this room or whatever it may be. But I think they will still stick to the fact that this problem can't be cured. And that's kind of what these defense attorneys have done throughout this whole trial. And I don't blame them because it's been so frustratingly bad on the prosecution side. So reports are that the judge has offered to grant a mistrial without prejudice if the defendants want to. So we're going to go through a couple steps to explain what all this means and what's happening. So first, can you explain what's the difference between a mistrial without prejudice and a mistrial with prejudice with regards to the defense? A mistrial with prejudice basically dismisses the case. They can't be tried again. The case is over and done with. They're innocent. They walk out of the courtroom. A well, mistrial. Hold on. Not necessarily they're innocent, but they're the double jeopardy is attached. So you can't retry them again. So they walk away. It doesn't sound like the declaring law. them no. innocent. I mean, it, I mean, it's a fiction, but it's yeah. under the law. They, they walk out free people. Okay. So what's the difference between mistrial without prejudice? A mistrial without prejudice means the case is over for that day and it can start over again. If the prosecutor wants to, they can try them again on the same charges or even additional charges. They can try it all over again. The trial can start all over and they've wasted a year uh, of, of this, uh, of the public's time and the public's money and, and everybody else's time. So they can try it again if it's without prejudice. One of the uh, important things is to, this motion that was made, remember that there's a rule in this case that if one defense lawyer makes a motion, they all make the motion unless they specifically opt out of the motion. So even though everybody didn't stand up and move for a mistrial, the fact that that one lawyer moved for a mistrial and we didn't hear anybody say, you know, judge, we're opting out of this mistrial, that motion in the court's order is going to apply to everybody. Okay. So yeah, without prejudice, the state can come do it all over again. So is that really a win for the defense? Let's start with that. As you, well, I think it's a, I think it's a loss for the, I'm sorry. Let me frame the question and then we'll get your full answer. So as we're looking at it, when a defense is trying to figure out whether or not to accept a mistrial without prejudice, they look at, am I winning this case? Am I losing this case? Um, if we, if we agree to a mistrial without prejudice, maybe the state won't refile charges. So as you're kind of balancing this, how does the defense look at a mistrial without prejudice? What do you think they're considering and talking about? And what would you do in this situation? All right. The easier question is what would I do in this situation? Um, because think, you know, thinking of them and they're, they're smart lawyers. We all know that they're good lawyers in this courtroom. The fact is, would the case get any better for them if they wanted to try it a second time? Or is this about as good as it's going to get in this first trial? I think all it's going to do is allow the prosecutors to correct mistakes or to make it a better trial the next time. 
I don't think it can go any worse for the prosecutors basically than it's gone. Um, so I think these defense lawyers are probably weighing the fact, do we really want to try it again? Or do you think we've got the best shot of a not guilty now uh, the way it is? Uh, and that's what they're weighing. Uh, if I were them, it'd be a real tough decision to want a mistrial without prejudice. Uh, we'd have to, of course, you have to talk to your clients about it. You've got to you know, tell them the pros and cons. But everybody's, you know, the clients have been there the whole time. They've seen this case. They may realize it's not going to get better if we try it a second time. And when you say that and you say it's not going to get better and this was about as bad as it can go for the prosecutor. Some people may not understand that because the prosecution has put up a lot of witnesses. They've put up some things that are damning. Some people pointing the fingers, then obviously some flubs, some people I don't remember. Um, from our perspective as lawyers, it's gone horribly from the prosecution. But why is that? Why is sloppiness? Why is infinite delays? Why is recalling witnesses 20 times? Why is that bad for the prosecution and good for the defense? It doesn't prove their innocence. And that's what a question I've gotten is like, just because it's gone so bad for the prosecution, it's not like they're proving the defense are innocent. So why is that good in front of a jury? Well, because we have seen a lot of things the jury hasn't seen. Uh, we've seen these arguments and we, we've seen all of this. What the jury has seen is a bunch of witnesses saying, that this wasn't true, this didn't happen, this is not a gang. We've had a bunch of witnesses that have turned on the prosecutors, accused the prosecutors of bullying them uh, for their testimony. And we have seen that um, jurors, again, can jurors remember everything that's happened over a year? Uh, is their memory that good that they're going to remember all the testimony? Um, so, you know, jurors may not remember everything. Number one, and the, the trial is confusing. You're a juror. You sit for a couple of days, you're gone for a week. You come back for a couple of days, you're gone for a week or more than a week. So it's a very confusing trial. And it's, the burden is on the state to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. So beyond a reasonable doubt means they have to do away with all the confusion. They have to get rid of every a reasonable doubt that's been raised and including the quality of the investigation. That is something that is weighing on a jury. Did these people really do a quality investigation? Did they really tie up all the loose ends and prove this case beyond a reasonable doubt? Jurors are going to think back and say, you know what? Gosh, you know, I, I heard that testimony, but boy, it sure wasn't connected up. Or I, I, I don't remember, did this guy say this? Again, you got multiple defendants. Did they keep all the people straight? Uh, defendant A did this, defendant B. It's a very convoluted trial because you've got different charges on different defendants. And, you know, some defendants did this, some defendants did that. I, I really think that it's the kind of case where a juror, when they go back, are going to say, gosh, have they proved it beyond a reasonable doubt? Uh, I, I really think it's not going to get any better. Well, and, and I think it, the, the type of argument you can make is one of, what did they actually prove? You know, if you're the defense, you'd be like, go back and think, what did they actually prove? Did they actually prove these elements? And then if you're saying the jury's trying to go back a year and figure out when were these boxes actually checked, but then it comes down to a lot of arguing from the attorneys, like what actually happened, what did come in, what didn't imagine objecting to something facts, not in evidence in this trial. I mean, it would feel literally impossible um, to get to that point, but uh, so you say you would probably, knowing what we know, the lawyers all know a lot more than we know because they've been involved in this case for years, but knowing what we know, you might reject this option of a mistrial without prejudice, but what are you waiving by doing that? If you're a defense attorney, you've got appellate issues, you've moved for mistrial, judge will grant it without prejudice. Are you waiving all prior mistrials? Are you waiving all of your arguments for appeal? How much are you actually waiving by saying no to the offer of a mistrial without prejudice? And that's why I said before, you've got to talk to your client because your client really has to understand the ramifications of not moving or not wanting this motion for mistrial, because I don't think it's going to correct uh, or waive prior mistrials, but it will on this issue. And so I think it will waive their right to appeal based on this issue which again, isn't a big deal because frankly, no court is going to reverse this case based on the fact that he said free Quay uh, as a hashtag. So I'm, I'm not really worried about waiving that particular objection, but the, the 
client has to know and has to understand there is going to be some waivers involved in not granting this motion. And that's why you've got to really get their permission. So it is interesting to me because I, I tend to agree with you, but it depends on if she granted the mistrial based on all of the prior motions and all the prior issues, there could be some waiver issues, I think, with some of that. But I also think as defense attorneys, we have arguments to the appellate court that a, a mistrial without prejudice is obviously very different than a mistrial with prejudice. And what we went through and the thinking and the fact that it was still an unfair trial at the end, you can still have some of those arguments. So you're not completely waiving everything, but there is going to be an element of waiver, like you said. And that's a scary thing for a defense attorney, right? I mean, defense attorneys don't like to do that. Oh, sure. And, and I have had this situation where a judge has actually told me, I'll grant your motion for mistrial, Mr. Tragos, uh, uh, if you want. And I've gone back and I've told the client, look, it's not going to get any better. Uh, they have screwed up really bad. So I think we should go ahead and waive our appellate issue, this appellate issue, and go for it. Uh, because it, uh, again, it, it's happened to me and I've done it and I've withdrawn those motions because I thought the case wasn't going to get any better. And the same thing happens in civil cases. Like we're, we're supposed to win on the plaintiff side. Usually what's going well, something bad happens. We got to be careful asking for a mistrial. If we're crushing it on that case and it's not as big of an issue as it may be, and we're saying mistrial and we're going to redo it all, we got to spend money, we got to take time. So the, these considerations are always right. I think this happened in Rittenhouse too, where they asked him if he wanted a mistrial without prejudice, but they thought it was going so well for them that they ended up saying, no, they only want one with prejudice. They tried to protect their appellate issues by saying no, only with prejudice and those arguments. They ended up saying no to the mistrial. And then obviously we know how that trial ended in a not guilty verdict. Um, Okay, so that's the mistrial issue. But the second issue is a lot of plea negotiations have been discussed. Are they meeting with Fannie Willis? Are they going to, to potentially um, strike some kind of plea deal as a prosecutor, right? Because you're former prosecutor dealing with stuff like this. As a defense attorney, what is this like at this point in the case, knowing we may have a mistrial, we may have to do this all over again. Actually, sorry, I'm interrupting myself here. Before we get to the plea negotiations, what are the considerations of a prosecutor if the judge does grant this mistrial without prejudice? Are they going to do it again? Are we going to spend another year or two trying this case? Millions of taxpayer dollars with the pressure, with elections, with all this stuff going on. Do you really think they would retry all of these defendants? I don't know if they'd retry all of all of them. They're going to retry some of them for sure um, because they've just spent too much time and money. The publicity, uh, publicity makes a difference. A lot of people say, oh gosh, you know, you shouldn't, but, but it does. Public it, pressure it makes a difference. You and just saw a lot of Menendez, how big of a difference the public pressure meant in Menendez. They rushed that and now, boom, they're getting a resentencing. Right. So it, it makes a difference. Uh, I think they will retry, if not all, at least some of these defendants. Uh, and I mean, they've got to retry it a better. There's got to be a better trial than the one we're having uh, because Miss Love had to have learned something, I hope, from this. So, OK, so you think that they would retry at least some of them, which leads us then to plea negotiations. So you got to keep that leverage as a prosecutor that, yes, we're going to retry these cases. If they didn't think that, obviously, they'd take the mistrial. The case is over. So now as we go into plea negotiations from both sides, what's happening? What are they thinking? Uh, well, this is a uh, there's a lot to say here uh, about plea negotiations because, again, a lot of what I know is from rumors. Some of what I know is from lawyers in Georgia that aren't involved in the case, but, but that I've heard. But uh, they actually started a meeting Wednesday night uh, with Fannie Willis. Uh, and so that very night, they're meeting with Fannie Willis, and they're going on into Thursday with their meetings. They're meeting one on one, which means that you know there's not a group of defense lawyers going in with a group of defendants. Everybody is going in and pleading their individual client's case with Fannie Willis. But I'm going to um, interrupt Mr. you a couple times because I know it's going to be a long answer. Sure, no, no, it is. Yeah, go ahead. Stuff. So. When you say they're meeting with her individually, that doesn't mean that those defense attorneys then can't go talk and say, I got offered five years. How much did you get offered? Unless there's some agreement to do that with the state. It, 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 yes, they can do that. I've got to be honest with you, though. I don't think they would. Um, it's because not best I, their client. Right. They have to do what's in their best, the best interest of their client. Right. So they'll keep, they'll keep mum because they're going to try to get the best deal for their client. And that best deal may include cooperating against the other people. And if they do have to cooperate, they don't want the other people to know they're making a deal. So there's a lot going on. Plus, there is, I think, let's be honest, let's be frank, there's probably some safety risks uh, as well. These people are incarcerated. 
Um, when they find out they're starting to cooperate, there may be some safety risks uh, to different individuals who may start to cooperate. Uh, my understanding is they're not being housed in the same county jail, but they're actually being housed in two different county jails in two different counties. Um, so there's some safety risks involved. So their lawyer, uh, it's, it's in his client's best interest ethically. I think he can keep his mouth shut when he comes out of that meeting and only talk to somebody he has to in order to make that deal. Sometimes it's the client's mother. Sometimes, you know, the client wants you to go talk to his wife. Uh, different, there are different uh, dynamics involved in making some decisions on deals. Uh, Mr. Steele, for example, I know, and if I was the other lawyers, I'd take this posture too. Mr. Steele won't talk to Ms. Love. Uh, and so Miss Love, when these negotiations are going on, my guess is Miss Love's being cut out. Uh, now, Fannie Willis may talk to Miss Love privately, but no, none of these defense lawyers want Miss Love in that room when they're making, they're having these discussions. And Mr. Steele specifically has said it. So if you represent the big fish like Mr. Steele does, does this make you nervous when, when some maybe legitimate or better offers are coming down the pipe, maybe even some sweetheart deals to testify, I would also think that most of these guys are probably not going to flip on each other or they already would have before this point. They've probably all been offered deals before or most of them have been offered deals before. So it would have to be some really sweet deal. And if you feel like you're winning and you feel like you have the leverage, you've kind of talked about it from the state attorney side, from the defense attorney side, like what would make you want to take a plea deal? What would you consider? Would you only try to push a united front all or nothing? Let us go. Or maybe we do a year or time served or what, what kind of deals are you looking at as defense as a defense attorney? Well, the all or nothing is both ways. Fannie Willis may be saying the same thing. Fannie Willis has the right to say, either I make a deal with all you defendants because I want this trial to be over, Makes or sense. I make a deal with none of you defendants. She's got that right uh, to do that. Um, and the defense lawyers have the right too. They have the right to say, you make a deal with all of us or none of us, although there are some ethical issues in saying yeah. something like that. But you can have a joint defense agreement type of deal, and th there are things you can do. But I, I generally speaking, I get it. They're individual cases, right? You have to individually, because you know what if you're, they will tell you your client say, "Look, we'll be willing to drop charges against your client," and you say, "Oh no, I don't okay. want you to drop charges against Only my client unless too. unless you make a deal with everybody." Yeah. <laughs> so you know you're not going to say something like that. Uh, plus, these defendants are each they're unique. They're charged with different things. Um, and, um, was a little, oh, I forget one of the defendants is little something, I forget, but he's already serving a life sentence. Well, you think about it, somebody that's already serving a life sentence, he's not going to snitch on much him. less incentive to make yeah. a deal because yeah. he might as well sit there in trial and, and, and take his chances because he's already serving a life sentence. Little Bo, I think it was which one. So he's already serving a life sentence. You've got a guy like, like Thug, Thug has no criminal record. He has nothing bad in his past. He is totally clean sitting in that courtroom. He's in a different position than some other guys who have some prior uh, criminal convictions. Uh, so th they're, they're in different postures. And Fannie Willis is looking at them in, in different postures. Plus, and you know, we're talking about publicity, Fannie Willis in two weeks is her reelection. She's up for reelection. The vote happens in two weeks. What's happening right now could really affect the vote. Yeah. And again, we talked about this quite a while ago where the opponent for Fannie Willis said she would made an announcement. She would drop all the charges in the thug case, you know, not knowing anything, but she would drop all the charges in the thug case. Well, what has that done? I, I saw in the, in the uh, paper, I forget, next last couple of days, that thug's father publicly came out with an endorsement. Of course. Of Sure. <laughs> of the person running against Fannie Willis. So you've also got an election coming up with Fannie Willis. You've also got a scheduled protest this morning that's supposed to happen in front of the courthouse. People are supposed to protest to try and, you know, protest and say, drop the charges, mm -hmm. drop all the YSL charges. So there's, there's a protest actually, actually going on this right now in front of the courthouse. So people are starting to protest. You've got an election coming up. You've got a year's worth of expenses and you've got a horribly embarrassing trial that people are just embarrassed by the prosecutor's office, um, the way they've been trying this case. Uh, and you've got a judge that's ready to do something. Finally, apparently she's had it 
and is really ready to do something on the cumulative effect of all this case. So then going back to where we started, Fannie's sitting in her office, defense lawyers come in, they start negotiating for their clients. Georgia, and I'm, I'm going to a different thing, and that these are the possible options that, that Fannie has. Georgia is much more inventive than Florida is with regards to options. Uh, they have things in Georgia that we don't have. And so I, I, I can't tell you, again, we're Florida lawyers. So I'm, I'm telling you kind of a general, they actually have uh, pleas that you can make where you can go to jail, get out of jail, and they take your file and throw it in the trash can so that you were, so that it never happened. They actually have a plea like that in Georgia. Um, they have a lot of so like our PTI, except you actually go to jail. And they do have diversion programs like PTI, pretrial intervention. So they've got a bunch of different diversions. And they have two kinds of diversions in Georgia, formal and informal. Uh, so formal, my guess is you have to go to court and do all the you know paperwork. Informal is kind of like, well, we'll just watch you for 18 months. So they've got they have a lot of options there. Plus, these people have been in prison two and a half years, something yep. like that, that they've already been in prison. Uh, I don't know. I, it's a long time. Yeah, I think it's like two and a half years. Well, my gosh, you got two and a half years. You can do a lot of time served. Right. All right you plead guilty to this charge and you can have time served and we'll let you out. And from uh, my perspective, like, it, it, and I think it's Fanny. We always say Fanny Willis. Uh, that's oh. like the first time I ever heard it. So it's burned into my brain like that. Okay. Um, but from her perspective, if you can get them to plead guilty to something, even if it's a lesser type of crime, you can be like, look, it was worth it. We kept these guys off the street for a number of years. They learned their lesson. They pled guilty if they do anything else in the past. I mean, in the future, now we have them already with felonies on their record. So they're, you know, hopefully they'll know not to do anything in the future. If they do, we can hammer them with even more, you know, larger prison sentences. So you can kind of save face a little bit after all this to get them to admit to some kind of criminal wrongdoing. If you can get there, and I can see how that could be a political victory for Fonnie Willis if they're ab if they're you know able to pull something like that off. I don't really know. I feel like the defense attorneys are probably in a pretty confident position right now, don't you think? Oh, I, I think so. But I also think they're not so foolish. You gotta be realistic. Right. They're not they're, they, these are these are again, these are smart guys. They know what they're doing. And they yeah, will ignore the, the emotion. The, the female attorney that made the motion today, but yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I'm talking generically. All, attorneys. All the attorneys. They know they're realists. So they know, okay, yeah, we may win this trial, but there's no sure things in life. Uh, but if we make a deal with the prosecutor, that's a sure thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and they'll go back and tell the client, look, we may win this trial, but right now, if you want, you can walk out of jail. Yeah. Uh, and go home and to your family. you have to do. What? You can go home to your family. Right. So, you know, and it's not like, I mean, a lot of them are rappers, right? So it's not like they're not going to be able to go out and make money. Like some people, it's like, I've been in jail for two years. If I agree to a felony, I can't get my job. I lose my license to, you know, be a doctor or whatever it is. But a lot of these guys can go back out, go with their families, go back to their careers, at least some of them. So, I mean, that's, that's not the worst option in the world. Now, easy for us to say, because we don't have to say we did something that we're, we swear we didn't do. Um, in, in taking some kind of plea deal, which I understand if they want to stand on principle and they want to say no, and they didn't do anything and they're not going to say they did anything they didn't do, then, then that's fine. And this is the dynamics of discussing it between a lawyer and a client when you're talking about plea deals, but lawyers are famous for pounding their chests. I'll never settle. I'll never plea to anything. I'll never take any deal. And then that's what ends up happening using leverage, using publicity and things like that. So while it seems like they have a very strong position and they have all the leverage and all the confidence and it's been going their way, they realize at the end of the day, they got a lot of defendants, they got a lot of law enforcement officers, prosecutors calling them gang members saying they committed all these crimes. We've seen Rico work in other situations with rappers and celebrities in the past. Do you really want to take that risk for as long as you could end up in prison versus, yeah, some kind of time served, go home today or serve six more months or whatever it may be? That's a viable option. Right. And you, you raise an interesting point about career path. Um, is a felony conviction a negative in these rappers' career paths? You know, I mean, is, is it or isn't it? Uh, 
And especially because they can say they beat the big charges, right? I mean, yeah. I, I got the whole album sure. about this trial and how they beat these charges and how it was so unfair what the prosecutors did to them. I mean, I, right. there, there's a lot of material here. We'll just put it that way. Right. So, um, and like I said, there's a lot of options in Fanny. I mean, Fanny, what, what, what'd you say? Fonny. How do you, it's Fonny. Yeah. Fonny has a lot of options. She has a lot of things in her toolbox that she can use to try to negotiate a plea here. It's all within her control. And so I think that she is going to try very hard to work out deals with these guys and end this trial. I really think she is. I think the one she'll have the most trouble with is the one that's already serving a life sentence because it's hard to work a deal out with a guy like that. Yeah, but it's also if he's the only one, you can just keep trying the case against him. It's a lot easier. There's just one right. guy sitting there. You just keep trying it against him. And then and then nobody cares what happens in the end, frankly. It's just the taxpayer dollars. But at the end of the day, it doesn't really make that big of a right. difference. So if you had to guess how this ends, what would you say? Um, Obviously, we I have would, no idea. This is just a complete guess because there's a million factors we don't know. But what would you guess? I would guess that if, if again, if I were... Ms. Willis, um, I would make a deal with everybody. I try to make a deal with everybody and end this trial. Uh, that seems if, like the most logical ending to me. Right. I don't know I, that I that's going to happen. It. We don't know different people's pride or different people's principle or or what they could end up doing when it actually comes down to signing the dotted line. But that absolutely seems like the most logical ending. And I might even do what, what I said before. I might even say it's an all or nothing. Uh, I might even tell the defendants, look, Either everybody takes a deal or we just go ahead and, and finish this trial and see what happens. Or do it over again if you want to take the mistrial. Because I don't think the prosecutors are scared of a mistrial. I mean, public backlash and waste of money is is one thing, but I think they know it could go better a second time around. Oh, absolutely. All right. So those are our thoughts. We're trying to stay on top of this stuff. It's been impossible for me to really stay on top of this trial as well. But thank you to everybody on Twitter who tagged me in different clips to watch to help me catch up. And my dad's following a little bit more than I am. Um, but we will continue to give you breakdowns when you guys shine the bat signal and have your questions. That's what we're here for. So thank you for joining us. Please make sure you guys hit that like button and make sure you subscribe to our channel if you have not already. But until next time, we're out of here. Thanks for watching another episode of The Lawyer You Know. If you enjoyed the episode, please hit the thumbs up and share with your friends who may be interested here on YouTube. And don't forget to subscribe. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok. And don't forget to check out The Lawyer You Know podcast with new seasons dropping every quarter. If you have a case you want to talk to us about, if it's a personal injury case, wrongful death, catastrophic injury, car accident, or slip and fall case, please email us at lawyeryouknow at gmail.com. And of course, all these links I just mentioned are included in the description below on this episode and every episode. So until next time, this is Peter Tragos, The Lawyer You Know.